For those of you who may not know me, I am a graduate of the old Albuquerque High School at Broadway and Central. A graduate of the University of New Mexico, wife to a career Navy officer. As the chief coach for AYSO, I have been a Department of Energy contractor to Sandia National Labs for a number of years. And most importantly, well maybe not most importantly, I have been a, a legislator for four terms in the New Mexico House. But this is most important. I have two terrific young adults who call me mom. I'm very, very proud of them. So ladies and gentlemen, we have our hands full. My goodness. And yet there are answers. And I want you to remember that we have control of our own destiny. Indeed, there are problems. And we were just talking about how bad Congress is right now. I promise you that when we elect people who are more concerned about your problems rather than their name on a bill, we're going to change things. And that's how I operate. You know, in this state, we, we are truly facing some some very interesting problems, not the least of which 49 other states are coming after us. Now, I am a DOE contractor. I know exactly what that means. It means because we do not have a budget, and we have not had one for three and a half years, we have hidden unemployment. That means that there are probably another 20% unemployed today. They're living off of their IRAs. They're living off of their 401ks. And here's how this works. And I'm living proof. This is how it works. The government tells your primary source, which is Sandia, we're not going to fund that part. And they call you up and they say, got a contract, but we're not going to fund this part of the contract. And you as an employer go to your employees and say, they're not funding the contract. I have to take you off of your benefits. And then you go to them and you say, I'm sorry, I can't give you your benefits back, but now you're on project status. And pretty soon you have to say, don't come in until we have work, we just don't have anything. And you may ask, why don't people in this category apply for unemployment? <clears throat> they don't. And I'm not sure that they should. It is because their clearances are hanging in the balance. We are at risk right this minute of losing such intellectual capital because Congress, Congress failed to do its job. I'm tired of it. And when we pass a budget, you will see things turning around in Albuquerque. You will see things changing in Congressional District 1. Now there are so many things that we need to do, and not the least of which is we've got to talk about some real health care solutions. I am not a fan of the Affordable Care Act for a number of reasons. I am a legislator, so I do not like bills that are so complicated that the average citizen cannot pick it up, read it, and understand it. Have any of you read this bill? Did you like it? It was a cure for insomnia. It was terrible. It was terrible. But I believe that just as a general rule. And you know, I know we get beat over the head a lot in New Mexico because we're last about a lot of things. But our Constitution in New Mexico has two really good things. And one it is that you have to have a balanced budget. I know how to do that. It is possible. This state does it year in and year out. And it has the single issue requirement. And that single issue requirement would, would keep us from having earmarks and a lot of other bills. But one of the things that I think is really important about single issues is things that I really liked about the Affordable Care Act. And there were a couple things I really liked. I like being able to have my 25-year-old daughter who is driving across the country at this minute back to Temple Law School. I like having her on my insurance policy. That gives me great comfort. The pre-existing condition issue, we have debated this forever. Shame on us. We have an entire population that Congress needs to step up to the plate. And it's not only the pre-existing conditions, but let me give a plug for the developmentally disabled community who is going to be joined by our returning veterans with traumatic brain injury. The long-term care that they are going to require. You know what? That's our responsibility. As a country, that's our responsibility. And the way that Congress should be dealing with this is not handing it off to an insurance company. By golly, you budget for it. You have a line item. You do it. 
and it is possible for us to do these things. The other thing that we could have resolved is to make insurance policies available across state lines. Those are three things could have been done in three very simple bills, which would not have compounded some of the other things that are happening. And, and I know that we can do this. And so some may say, well, well, what about how do you pay for it? You see, we actually had some very wise people a long time ago who said, you can choose to do an expenditure, but you are supposed to raise revenue and budget to meet all of your goals. Never a requirement to do it in the same bill, just so you know. There's a really good reason for that. So there are things that we can do, and when it comes to health care, I do believe that it is time to get the middleman out of health care. I believe it is time for us to truly address our doctor and nurse shortage, and I am afraid that we are going to drive more and more doctors literally out of business. They're just simply going to change their line of work. That bothers me. You know, there, there are many other things that we could do, but one of the things that I think we should be doing proactively is get people out of the emergency rooms. We have a very strong public health system. And for those of you who may have parents who were there during the time of, of the recession and the depression, we had a public health nurse system that did several very important things. They did immunization, they did communicable diseases, they did first aid, and they did referrals. We have, we have this. The trick is, is that you can't, you can't just push this by the side. Congress has to step up to the plate and say, this is either important or it's not important. To me, that's important. So, I believe New Mexico has tremendous opportunity today, right now. Not only from an energy perspective, but from many other types of intellectual capital. But I get so frustrated. We should be the focal point of America's energy recovery. We really have the natural resources. And I, I, I will not go too deep into this because I really like it. But we have something called rare earth elements. And the first question is, is why on earth are we buying them from China? And the second one is, is why aren't we developing them here? Now, here's a quiz. Who knows what a rare earth element is and why it's important to you? What is your favorite part of rare earth elements? The only way I found out, I was reading a book uh, of Jason Bourne, and it, what it does is it's, it's in the, they are the elements that are in some of the high tech stuff that can't be done any other way. Any other way, and you're and asking. So I, I don't know the specifics of what it is, but generally that's what it is. Well, I thank you. Yes, and so let me take you high tech and low tech. So low tech, how many of you use one of those long pointy lighters to light your grills? They're all going to go up in cost because China's cut, cut us off from rare earth elements. They do not function without a rare earth element. It is not flint in your lighter, just so you know. Your cell phones, your computer screens, there, um, there was a myriad of things that require rare earth elements. I'm a contractor at Sandia. Our weapon systems require rare earth elements. Anything we do in space because we're making it smaller requires a rare earth elements. Why am I telling you this long story? Because New Mexico has 13% of the world's deposits, and we are doing nothing. I believe it is time for this little bitty state to step up one more time and come to the aid of our nation. We did this in 1945, and we did so at great expense to our state. As a result, we have a federally dependent economy I'm glad we stepped up then, but today we need something different. We need our intellectual capital. We need to develop our own resources. I am very confident that the environmental standards will be higher than any place else in the world. But quite frankly, our country needs us, and they need us now. Let's go. Let's get this done. It would be an honor to be your representative. Step into the future with me. San Anita, Washington. Thank you. Again, in 2008, many, many promises. It didn't matter if Republicans, Democrats, Independents, it was all Washington needs to change, and we're going to do it, and we're going to be the instruments of change. Marched off to Washington and found out that it's a revolving, revolving, just keeps going around faster and faster. And all of a sudden, you get 
sucked into it in here, there, and all that stuff that we're going to change just gets lost. So how do you stop that from happening? Well, I won't stop it the first day. I, I, I can tell you that. But there are lots of ways to stop it. Um, and, and the first one is um, to, to know what you can do. And there's a lot that we can do. And in terms of stopping it, so a, a couple of things that I will do, because I've been there, I, I've been a legislator, please know that caucuses, caucuses are like your worst nightmare as a family. That's how they operate. And so you have to find a way to get outside of what's happening with your caucuses. Second thing that I know, there is not two sides to an issue. There are many, many sides. And as a representative, it's my responsibility to make sure that I hear all of those sides. And when the press starts hammering that there are only two sides, they are doing us a disservice. Um, and and the, the third thing, or the fourth thing that I would do is uh, to stop this is I, I'm going to propose a rule change in the House. And that rule change will require Congress to be in session three weeks on, two weeks off. And you may wonder why I'm doing that, but here's what I know. If I asked you to give me your vote, and you have no idea, if I have any idea what's important to you, would you give it to me? I want you to tell you. guess that she'll be better than the other person doing anything about Yeah, but I guess it's not a really good way to do this. The truth is, is Congress is like any other entity. You have to have a relationship. People have to know what you know, and they have to know that you care about what's important to them. Congress is no different. The current process of having Congress fly in Monday night or Tuesday morning, they operate from Tuesday early, early, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning sometimes, to noon on Thursday, and then everybody goes home. This mantra about our representatives being in the district means they're not building the relationships to get it done. And I, I can only tell you that I have experienced that in order to read all of the legislation that I read in Washington, and I did, I mean in, in Santa Fe, and I did read it, was I had to be there. If I'm going to be in the district, I need to be conscious, not comatose. And the current pro process gives you a comatose representative, and I don't think that's right. So those are some of the things that we can do, but, but the very belief that it is my responsibility to make sure that people are hearing what I am hearing bringing back that information because we're still a representative re government. And the truth is, you may not know the information that I'm going to hear in Washington, and it really may make a difference. It's my job to tell you what I'm hearing so that we get on, on the same wavelength. And I work really hard to do that, and so let me uh, extend this invitation. I'm so serious about this that I've been hosting a Saturday morning discussion group for four and a half years. We meet every Saturday, 9 to noon. It is very diverse. We don't agree, but we talk and we listen to one another. Southwest Secondary Learning Center, 9 to noon. Coffee's pretty good. <laughs> I get it. It's a local roaster, a cup of joe, very, very good coffee. So we'd love to have you. Yes, sir. I don't know how much you know about credit unions, but for decades the banks have been after Congress to make sure that we're taxed. Mm -hmm. um, even though our business model is substantially different from the banking model, mm -hmm. uh, they still for some reason want to see us taxed. Um, there's going to be continued assaults on Congress on both sides to, from the banking bankers uh, to, to do that. Uh, if you're elected, you will likely vote at least once, if not twice, on this issue. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to answer your question, but, but let me preface that by saying I would like to have a discussion about tax reform, which may change where I am right this minute. That is a long ways off. I have some very specific goals in terms of tax reform. Until we get to that point, I understand that as a credit union, you have a finite community. It may grow a little bit around the edges, but the truth is you have a defined community and your model is very different and it is to serve that community. Banks can do anything they want, literally. And so I will be, be supporting the credit unions on that. I think your staff should remain the same uh, because you are doing a different kind of service and I do differentiate it. And you know, I know the banks will hit me up pretty hard. It's okay. Wear a helmet. 
<laughs> okay. I, you know, I, I am uh, someone that literally started my career, um, such as it was when I got to the University of New Mexico, I got a, an internship to the New Mexico State Legislature. I needed reliable transportation. Thank goodness for the curtain of federal credit union. I was able to buy a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. That was back when I-25 was still two lanes, and I would come back at night and I had to buy my thing. <laughs> the little cold. Uh, but I, I am grateful, but I understand that you know this is, it is a different model. It is not it's not stockholders, it's <coughs> shareholders. Everybody's invested in the risk, and I, I appreciate that about credit union. Right. Yes, ma'am. Have you had a conversation with the banks at all? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. oh, sure. Have they raised this issue? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I kind of like it, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but, but this is a scope of practice issue for me, and it happens in many other industries. And do you have the absolute right and obligation to attempt to expand? You do. Are the banks who feel like they have the truth right now going to push back? They will. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. But I see it as two very distinct services. Yes? We want our members to have jobs and be able to pay their bills and use their services in a lot of ways. Um, they can do that if the economy works. And we know that down the road, we don't want to be able like to Greece or other countries that never balance their budget and then comes to under control. If we're going to close the deficit gap, we have to address the big four, defense spending, Medicare, Social Security, and eventually um, interest on the debt. Do you have a conceptual framework for what we call title one reform or how to address those issues? Oh, sure. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Did everybody hear the question? So <clears throat> there is no choice when it comes to some of the, the what we call entitlement programs. I actually do not think that Social Security and Medicare is an entitlement program. I think people pay for that. We made a promise. There is a group of people who are there. I think it's really important that we keep those promises. But I would be a fool to tell you that we will be able to keep those promises that we make up if we don't make some changes. And so there is going to be a day of reckoning where we do have to say that the age requirements must change. Otherwise, our kids will never be out of debt. And I think that's just morally wrong. I think that's wrong. Uh, as far as the other entitlement programs, so I, I'm a soccer coach. There are some entitled, what we call entitlement programs that I think are beneficial, and I'm going to go back to the TV waiver program. Absolutely critical. But when we keep people on unemployment and welfare and some of the other programs too long, instead of helping, you're disabling. And I think that is very unfortunate, and I think it's time to do that. I don't expect to make changes like this in one fell swoop, but I am going in that direction. Now, with regard to defense spending, we are at our lowest levels since 1945, believe it or not. I am the wife of a career naval officer. I am worried. We have fewer than 280 ships. I look at our nation from a national security perspective. And I do not like waste and fraud and defense spending. And the procurement code, this is not sexy talk, hard to campaign on this, but I will be working on the procurement code. It stinks, it is awful, and it is very wasteful. But what is going to happen on the defense side is we will, it's gonna change. We are not going to have battalions of people. We will have more special forces teams. We will not fight the traditional war. We will be fighting, literally, if we have to, from space. That is going to cost money. And so I am a very strong proponent of deterrence, which is, by the way, we're the only place in the country that does deterrence. I am very happy to keep the bad guys off our shores. And I think that's a prudent policy. And I, there are so many places to go with that. Did I hit the things that you were concerned about? Pretty much, I, as, even though I <clears throat> want to be safe, we have about a half of the naval fleet that exists in the world that is ours. 
And if we're going to pay for the world's policemen, it seems like somebody else can pay for it. But um, it just seems like we've got a model that's almost unsustainable, even though I've got a brother who's in Colonel Air Force. And so I understand how important it is. Um, I'm just concerned that do we have the money to do everything we want to do? Well, I, but you actually brought up a bigger point. And so, yes, I've spoken a lot about national security. But our greatest threat to national security is what you started your question with. It is the debt and deficit. The, the might of the United States of America was intrinsically tied to our ability to loan money to other countries. And we do not have that anymore. And so you're right. There are going to be some very hard choices. And to me, defense spending is not off the table. It is going to have to be across the board. It, it, it isn't going to be a lot of fun. But we have to do this in a way that does not crater our economy. And so can you say balancing it? But I, I know that's what we have to do. Um, question for you about much I'm kind of piggybacking on what Mr. Hayward said. Um, but nationally, I know I've worked with you in Santa Fe for many years. And there's not nearly as much animosity between the banks and credit unions as there is in Washington. Um, the, program, the, the problem and the animosity grow exponentially uh, there. And right now, our biggest legislative priority um, is increasing the cap, the statutory right. cap on member business lending that was imposed by Congress in 1998. Banks are, I mean, uh, just a couple of months ago, when the, the, before Congress went into recess, the banks literally spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to defeat that measure. And I mean, and, uh, in March, when we flew there for the big governmental affairs conference for the Credit Union National Association, the day before, Jerry Walker's group flew from New Mexico to D.C. to try to preempt our arguments and try to, you know, plant their seed um, in Congress regarding how bad this increase in member business lending was. Um, what What are your thoughts on that legislation? What are your thoughts in general about the dynamic between banks and credit unions? and where do you stand there? Because by the way, they're going to tell you, I know you said that credit unions serve a particular niche, a particular community, but what they're going to tell you is that credit unions are no longer doing that. The credit unions have grown to become huge beasts that are no longer what they were 50 years ago. Uh, and you know what, I, I've heard that, that before. Um, and so uh, let me just make sure that I, I, I'm going to answer you correctly. So if we increase the cap, when you make a loan, to a business, it's still to your membership, is that correct? Correct. I rest my case. That's the difference. And the difference is, is you're loaning money. And our banks, you know, I, I, I have to literally hunt around when I encounter small business owners and say, you know, I need, to, I need a $20,000 line of credit. I need a small loan. And the banks aren't doing it. When they step up to the plate and start doing this, then maybe there will be a compromise for me, but right now there isn't because the, the niche, the area that needs service is, quite frankly, our sole proprietors, our startups, our real innovators, and they don't need a million dollars. They need $20,000 or $50,000. Or, or $50, and who better than a member of an organization to say, you know, I, I think you have a pretty good business. And that's just where I am. And yes, Jerry has talked to me about that. <laughs> so, he has. Other questions? Did I scare you off? All right, so let me launch into this. You know, I, I do truly have some priorities going to Congress. Some some we will talk about, some we won't. But there are things that are beyond the priorities that I hope to work on. And so make no mistake about it. For me, this is not not the general population. I know what a what a legislative what somebody can do in a legislative body. I know what everybody's concerned about, and it's their jobs. So I want to assure you that outside of my staff, I will be creating no new jobs, just so you know that. But it is in Congress that we actually can change the regulatory process that is literally choking people. I met with um, actually a mining company that would like to start working on rare earth elements. I've been talking to them for 18 months. 18 months. <coughs> and the process to to actually get their permits through, get the licensing through, is probably going to exceed the startup capital that they have available. And they will be dead before they get out of the gate. That just makes me sick, especially when I know some of the problems are. When you were doing 
environmental work, you have to do something called certs and rests. Do you all have to do that? It, it's a set of documentation that, that as a company that does this kind of work, you have to maintain your certify every time. One of the simple answers is, since every single contract, every single permit requires certs and rests, why are we still doing this on a paper-based system? Why cannot you certify your certs and reps in a database annually so that anybody involved can go to it? It saves time, it saves resources, but th those are just simple things that we can do. And the nice thing about being a legislator is you can get stuff like that done. You don't need legislation to get it done. And, and the trick is, is trying to figure out where, where you pull the thread that's the most effective. Um, there, and, and there's, you know, so debt and deficit, the tax code. We didn't talk about the tax code. So any of you think the tax code is fair? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, it's time to change it. You know, and I look at what we have done. And when I look at, especially my colleagues that happen to have small businesses, and they, they would come to me and they go, how come this guy down the street's in the same business that I'm in, and our state gave them a special deal, and I don't get to have any part of it? When did we get so off track? And the first clue I had was the very first bill I had on tax and revenue when I was elected. And it read something like this. In a class A county where the population is greater than 300,000 but less than 350,000, <laughs> in a business east of I-25 but north of I-40 that did X, Y, Z. Guys, that's not right. That is, uh, that is completely contrary to what I believe our system of government is, is when we make a law, a bill, a tax reform, it should be as broad-based as possible. And we have now so carved up our tax code that I think it's not fair. Time to change it. Sir? You mentioned regulatory reform. Um, I've heard some business owners say that they're kind of waiting to see what happens in terms of expanded business because of regulatory issues. Yeah. Um, CFPB went from zero to about 900 people last time I checked. The last couple of bills that came out were like 1,400 pages and 200 pages. They were just about mortgages, which I'm sure will simplify how to get a mortgage going. And I'm sure it will help the consumer. But um, <laughs> if you were to, uh, to go to Congress, how would you deal with trying to protect the consumers without destroying them with whatever you're trying to save them by doing with the CFPB? What well put? Uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, one is you, you do have to have the consumers in mind, but I don't do the consumers any service or benefit if the people who are doing oversight and compliance for the people who are trying to do business with them is so onerous that it takes 20% of their revenue because who pays for that? It is the consumer. So in there, there is a balance. And I think we have to be careful about the type of accountability that we are asking for. Because if accountability does cost money, so you better make sure you're getting what you're asking for. And I think our processes are archaic at best. And we have no place so far in Congress that actually looks at process. And it is the process that oftentimes helps the hurts. And I would like to make sure it's more helpful. And certainly. Yes, sir. One question uh, about your race. Yes. What, what is your plan to win? I mean, um, as you know, Michelle was here earlier, and she pointed out the fact that she outraced you five to one in the last in the last quarter. So, what is your plan to win? I mean, there's 80 some odd days between now and election. Well, I would say Michelle did, but Michelle had a primary. I started out in a primary with an opponent who was formidable. And for many reasons, he decided not to run. Very sad, because I think having a primary is a good thing. So there was very little reason for the Republican side to give me money at that time. Michelle spent her money. And I assure you that we are probably today, right this minute, when you look at cash on hand, probably fairly even. Now, if you think I stood still during the primary, I did not. I really believe, I've always believed, in face-to-face -face retail politics. I have been knocking doors since last year. We do that one-to-one. -one. We make phone calls. But the money is coming much faster than it was. And there's no doubt that uh, you have to raise enough money to be on television to cut through the clutter. And I just want to give you a vision of what you all are going to be facing. And so when you see one of my ads, do let me know. But we have a Senate race. 
that is hotly contested. And I predict that beginning about October 1st, <coughs> there will be no other advertising on there except for stuff about the Senate race. You know, I, I'm sure that we will have the axe murder ads versus the scandal ads. And my guess is, if Michelle and I don't get this done in September, you may not be able to see it. Um, and so I do think it's hotly contested. Right now, um, you know, I, I would never uh, suggest what, uh, what Michelle's team is doing. My team is strong with volunteers. Um, we have over 200 active volunteers, but we've had that number for months. And we are out every day, and we're out raising money. So, um, but the most important thing that I can do is, is the opportunity to come and talk to you and, and have you talk to your friends and introduce me. It's huge. Um, I know everybody thinks that the entire state knows who I am. Uh, because in, And let me just go back. You know, I ran for governor because I really thought a woman was going to get elected. I was half right. <laughs> I was. <laughs> um, and, and you would think that everybody thinks that they know me because of that. That's not so. And you would think because Michelle has served all these years that everybody knows her. Not true. And so we're actually kind of at a level playing field. Um, Michelle is my colleague. Um, it's really interesting to want to get somebody that you like. Uh, but, but we come at things very differently. And so I think it's going to be very interesting. There will be at least five debates that I'm aware of. Only three will be televised. And here's just something that is so irritating. Uh, the major broadcasters will not do our debates until after the 20th of October. Mm -hmm. How much voting has already taken place at that point? So you can tell how interested they are in this race. But it's a really important race. And, and for me, um, being able to go and tell our story with the labs, with our natural resources, standing up to people who, who are going to say, New Mexico has only two million people. Why do you get all of this? I will make the case for this state. I hope that answers Good. Any other questions? I mean, this has really been a privilege. Um, but it doesn't have to be financial. There's all kinds of stuff to talk about. Well, then I, I do have a question. Um, I work for a credit union in Santa Fe. And we have about census like 15% uh, of underrepresented. In, in Santa Fe, so I assume that the, the numbers might be um, similar throughout the state. What is your stance on immigration reform in the Dream Act? Um, I, I actually have a very strong stance on it. One is I believe we should be a nation of laws. I believe that we should be able to comply with our laws, and I think it is wrong to not do that. That being said, when our same nation sets it up so that even people who are complying now become non-compliant, that's not right either. And so I think we have to address it head on, and I do want to separate out border security from immigration. We are still a nation of immigrants, and we absolutely have to find a way to invite people in and invite people in to become citizens of our country. The DREAM Act is very sensitive to me, and I know that the President thinks that he did a good thing by saying we're going to ignore a certain set of laws. I think that is wrong. I think the executive does not have the right to do that. And in the state of New Mexico, we have debated the DREAM Act. Here is the ugly truth. If you are a Native American who lives in the state of New Mexico, you can't take advantage of the opportunities of the DREAM Act. If you are the child of someone on my active duty, you will not be able to take advantage of opportunities like the DREAM Act. And I'm sorry, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. That doesn't mean that I don't have compassion for kids who have grown up here. I do not believe it is right to visit the sins of the parents on a child, which is what the Dream Act is attempting to address. And so somewhere in the middle, we've got to find an answer. And let me propose one. Um, hotly debated, but I think money is not the answer. Shipping people back home is not the answer to me either. We don't have the resources. So I'm going to propose something. Let's talk about it. What if? We say, all right, if you're here and you're undocumented, X amount of time, a year, raise your hand. Go through the processes. And because I'm a person who believes in laws, I don't believe in giving someone advantage for breaking the law. But I understand the situation. So what if we say, if you want to be here, you want to stay here, start becoming a citizen today. The penalty for having broken the law is not financial. It is withholding the vote for X amount of time. 
as another way to approach this problem because we still need immigrants. We need them. We need their expertise. I gotta find another way to do this. So I'll not take your feedback. Let me know what you think. If we have good integration, I don't think you're so scared of them because of the uh, Worse than that, did you know, have you looked at our census? The next cohort of individuals is 20% smaller than the baby boomers. And the cohort after that is also smaller. This is, we've got to deal with this, you know, and, and hiding from it or just, you know, lining up on two sides and saying, this is the only way to do it. We can't do that. Thank you, immigration reform. One of the other things I'll just say, just one of the irritations I have with government is the use of technology in the appropriate places. So the, the immigration agency, in my opinion, is understaffed. But it's paper-based. Are you kidding me? I, and that just really bothers me. So, <laughs> so maybe you had a question. Oh, no, actually, I was just, I was just thinking about something. But when you talk about national security, something that's jumped off the page at me lately that, um, and I, it's been on the television, and, and you're probably very familiar with this and have a lot more information, but the cybersecurity piece of it for national security, um, and we are not, I don't think we are fully informed as to what that actual threat is, but I had occasion to talk to a gentleman that had um, someone from New Mexico Tech and, Lips, and a person from Los Alamos Labs address a group of his and it was it is, the cybersecurity threat is so systemic that they talked about how they went in and even hacked into a hospital system and all the CT scans were being misread. I mean that's terrifying that cybersecurity, you know, from a financial services sector standpoint Huge. We fight that all the time. The time and resources, money that's thrown after that to protect our financial data, if you know, for our membership. And yet, I don't, I guess I just look at it, you know, with my filter. But now I hear about this kind of thing going on and I'm going, how, how is the United States going to be able to address this in terms of just the number of people and the financial resources that are going to have to be thrown at it to fight it, to stave off, you know, hopefully the the unknown. Um, one is, is our own government needs to actually get engaged. So the best at cybersecurity is financial services. And I know you all may think that that you've had a few places where you fell down, some stupid things have happened. You're probably the best, followed by. Uh, the Department of Defense and the National Laboratory System. The rest of government, it's stunningly bad, which includes your medical records, Social Security, all of those things. And, and so since I, my area of expertise at San Diego, system test and system integration, we're talking about just these things. There are a lot of actually very simple things that you can do, but the truth is, is we're not going to go backwards. We are not going to not use these tools because we realize that we are more productive. But there are um, things that we do need to be doing right this minute. And, and the guys down in New Mexico Tech are actually working on something called packet security. Very, very interesting way of sending out a message um, that looks like a puzzle. Some of them are red herrings, and only the person with the key can actually put the puzzle back together in the internet. Unfortunately, what it will do to the, uh, the bandwidth is pretty stunning. Uh, so I don't know that that's going to work out. But there are still very simple things that we should be doing, even as a government. And let me tell you how simple some of the things are that we should be doing. Um, you are on a 24-hour cycle. When was the last time you literally disconnected your system? See, the, the challenge is, is where there is sensitive information like the CT scans, can you disconnect? Yes, you can. Disconnecting is one of the greatest defenses for cybersecurity. So if you can narrow the window, so what else can you do? I, I do think that we do have the answers, but it is going to be an evolving hot scotch type of game, and it isn't going to be, uh, one of the mindsets is um, continuing improvement. We're going to have to let that go. Continuous improvement, not in this arena. 
arena. This is like leaps in technology, leaps in security. And when it is time to leap, you've got to do that because if you do continuous improvement, you're going to get eaten. And, and the sad thing is, is our kids are out there, you know, they're just poking around. And if you have an open port, by the way, not to make you nervous or anything, but having done this with the state of New Mexico, there are 900 open ports between tax and revenue in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And so what do I mean by an open port? That's as simple as a place that I could go take a hatchet and cut the lines. And they're just available. So not, not an easy question, but we have to address it. Um, but I do think um, as we go forward, just like campaigning two years ago, uh, when I was doing certain things that people thought were very high tech, it really was quite expensive. Now they're included in other services that are much less expensive. So that evolving knowledge is helping as well. But listen to your technologists. Turn your computers off. I know that there's, we went through the whole period where it said, make sure you leave them on because they like it better. No, 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 don't listen to that. It used to be true, it's not true anymore. Turn them off. How many of you turn your cell phones off every day? Turn your cell phones off every day. Those little bitty widgets and digits, they really like it, but that's one of the ways you protect yourself from some of the stuff that comes in. And it allows it to reset. And, and they're really designed to do that. Don't turn it off. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be long, but you know, give it, at least, you know, if you can afford to give it five minutes, you know, um, much of the things that you had stored in there, some of the cookies and other things, um, you know, you're not a target anymore if you turn it off. And, and that, it's just real simple. So. But, but it's not, it's a very complex problem. And as we do more telemedicine, and I hope we do more telemedicine, um, certainly in Michigan. It is a privilege. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let us go into the future. Engage.